Okay, it's time to get started. It is time. So we do have uh, screen sharing enabled. Um, that will be for the presenters. Kate will be driving that. Um, thank you very much for that, Kate. Um, Kate will also be keeping us on track with uh, time warnings. It, those will apply uh, to 10 minute blocks. We have 10 minutes for each speaker in inclusive of uh, the lightning talk and also inclusive of questions and transition time. So we'll have time for one question, one, one brief question and answer after each talk. There's a small chance we could do two, uh, but we're just gonna plan on one. Um, and so Kate, Kate will give time warnings um, when we are running out of our 10 minute block. She'll type that into the, into the chat um, I'll try to also keep us on time so we can keep it moving. Um, I'll be moderating today. This is a little this is a little mini conference. This is an ecoinformatics conference. It's the first of what I hope will be an annual conference. Um, and if we have other universities who join this, uh, we over time uh, might make this a digital conference where students from other universities also join in if they're also participating in this ecoinformatics curriculum because that is the aspiration of the program that we're building, is that it would be used at universities around the world. So we're gonna treat this like a conference um, and it is an Ignite format conference. Um, the Ignite format is a five minute talk um, where the slides advance automatically to keep us on pace. It's the, it's the most condensed rapid fire format that you can do for a conference uh, and talks and so um, this is good for the students. Um, it's also good for our sponsors uh, and, and networks who are participating in developing this, this uh, program uh, because we can pack it all into a really short time. Um, so I, I, I hope that this is a successful format. We haven't tried it before. And this is all first time. So I, I hope we can find out what you all think about it when we're done. Uh, we are recording this session, um, so you'll see a little blinking recording sign there uh, in Zoom. Um, you need to let us know uh, now if you don't give permission uh, for recording, um, in, in which case um, a good way to mitigate that is if you turn off your video and mic um, and don't type anything in, uh, because if you don't, if you don't um, communicate anything, we won't have recorded it. Um, but we, we have permission from the presenters to record. Um, please type questions into the chat box. Um, that'll be a good way to tee them up during the five minute talk so that we can hopefully pick out one uh, to answer afterward. Um, I will do that by picking out the question and, and reading it. Um, one more thing about the format um, that Kate will help keep us on track with um, is she will uh, tee up uh, the talk that is, uh, that's going to be delivered first, um, that are coming up next, um, and also the one after that. So um, every time a session ends, she'll, she'll give a name uh, for the next presenter and she'll also give the presenter after that. So if you hear your name as the presenter after that, uh, get ready to jump in. Are there any questions before we get started? Kate dropped the schedule for today into the box. That's helpful. I'm gonna download that and open it up so I can stay on track. Any questions? I'll wait another second in case you're trying to unmute yourself or type it into the box. Okay, let's go on. Uh, let, let's get going with the with the conference. Um, with no further delay. Great, who's thank up you, Ben. First? Um, ben, first up, we have David Falling, who's going to be talking about creating a phenocam based index of fire haze. All right, thanks, Catherine. Let me get my slideshow started, and we'll just dive right in. 
So one of the things that we saw in our uh, course of the semester was that haziness of an image can be estimated using the hazer package in R. And this is a function that's based on a method described in a paper in 2014 that was originally developed to detect foggy images and estimate haze degree factor for a wide range of outdoor conditions. Unfortunately, it fails to detect smoke caused by nearby wildfires. With some mathematical tweaks, I hope that a new fire haze index can be generated to detect smoke from nearby fires. Now, this is Soaproot Saddle, a mixed pine and other trees forest in, on a neon field site in the Sierra National Forest, northeast of Fresno. From September 1st to 7th, the Creek Fire, which started in the middle of that week, advanced toward that neon site and has burned almost a half million acres so far. Comparing images from the same date range in two years, an average haze factor of around 0.3 is typical and it dropped to around 20% of that average by the time skies reddened and filled with smoke from nearby fires. Now this pattern repeated in other neon sites, including Rocky Mountain National Park and was even observable in the understory in California and Colorado among other places. Phenocam primarily serves as a repository for digital repeat photography and its derived data products to make them more widely available. And these cameras are low cost, easy to set up, so perhaps could be used in a remote detection system later on. The theoretical underpinnings of this algorithm partition a hazy image I into a convex combination of a haze-free image J and an atmospheric light component where that weighting is determined by its transmission medium. This transmission function is directly proportional to two easily computed functions of the haze image so we can use them as proxies. Using this decomposition together with average darkness and contrast, we'll compute that haze factor using this omega. And one thing we wonder is why does hazer produce values that are so much lower than average? The increased brightness by about 20%, both in the average and the maximum, increases this atmospheric light approximation from the algorithm and also decreased average darkness and dramatically increased contrast then contribute to a reduction in this computed haze. Now you can see this same trend in a series at Rocky Mountain National Park from October of this year when the fires advanced toward nearby towns. So- And David, can you um, reshare your screen so we can see what we're ta you're talking about? Huh, I wonder what happened. Give me a second. like when the slide advanced, it stopped sharing. All good. All right. So this is the Rocky Mountain National Park view from the week where fires advanced toward nearby cities. And what we might wonder is if we can somehow alter the formula to mitigate this impact of dramatically increased brightness that seems to come from the red channel of the image. So at the moment, my workflow is fairly straightforward. Uh, in R, I pull the midday images from a desired site and date range from the Phenocam API. I use Hazer to compute the haze factor, brightness, darkness, and contrast on the average for the image, and then display the interesting series in seven day segments. And what I need to do is then tweak the original formula, which you can actually tweak those coefficients in the Hazer package and see if that results in any significant changes to detection ability. The particular transmission medium of wildfire smoke seems to boost the red color channel of the image, so I'll need to explore the effect of omitting it from the model given in the Mao paper and see if phenocam computed red chromatic coordinate is helpful in this case as well. After some further data analysis, I'll test some tweaked models by computing regression coefficients based on new training data that I assess against similarly constructed standards, with these being the ones from the original paper. All right, and that's it. Thank you, David. Um, perhaps you can show us the first two or three slides since we missed those with the um, screen sharing challenges of Zoom. Yeah, so I think for future presenters in PowerPoint, I think in your setup slideshow, if you have the browse as an individual and go to um, presenter mode, that's when it dropped screen sharing. So if you leave it as the original 
um, kind of where it takes over your whole screen, that'll work. You just lose the presenter panel. All right, so this was the Soap Root Saddle and Rocky, and those are the two that you missed. And here's the partitioned image. Fantastic um, presentation. I have a question. So, so what utility do you think this detection of fire could serve, say, for management? Um, I think perhaps in remote, because pheno camera type cameras are so cheap, you could present, potentially post them in sort of remote areas of wilderness that don't get visited and have it sort of looking for this reddening of the skies that showed up, you know, in major metropolitan areas in the kind of height of the fires in September and October. Agreed, it's a relatively inexpensive sensor and one that actually already exists over a lot of the United States, so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for David? We have a few minutes. Okay, hearing none, um, let's move on to our next presentation. Great, next up we have Paul Roman and he's gonna be talking about new linkages between canopy photosynthetic activity and soil CO2 concentration profiles. All right, so can you all see my shared screens? Uh, yes. Should be on the first slide, sweet. All right, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, my overall goal with this project is the combination of data that indicates how solar energy is captured above ground with data showing the amount of carbon dioxide that is released below ground. These processes are linked and tracking their seasonal patterns is a critical part of understanding the carbon cycle. I'll start with soil respiration which describes the process of underground organisms releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Understanding this process is critical because it releases more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than all fossil fuel emissions combined and is a significant part of the global movement of carbon. Soil respiration incorporates the cumulative respiration of heterotrophic organisms, such as soil microbes or mycorrhizal fungal networks, and the autotrophic respiration of plant root systems. So changing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the soil profile can represent respiration activity by soil organisms. A large part of this activity is driven by the breakdown of sugars transported from photosynthesis occurring in the plant canopy. This means there's a direct link between above ground photosynthetic rates and respiration within the soil. So the first data source utilized is the spectral wavelength time series produced with repeat digital imagery from the PhenoCam network. The green chromatic coordinate, or GCC, is a measure of greenness and can be used to track photosynthetic activity in a plant canopy. The example here shows the seasonal activity of a deciduous broadleaf forest canopy co-located with a neon site. So the second data source is neon suite of soil profile time series, starting with soil carbon dioxide concentration. This data is available at a high temporal frequency across five soil plots at numerous neon sites and provides a means of tracking seasonal respiration activity within the soil. Soil temperature and water content are also tracked at each soil plot. So soil temperature has a high diurnal variability, but tends to have gradual seasonal changes. It is critical to track since it has been shown to have a strong positive influence on soil respiration rates. And soil temperature variability is also directly related to depth, as you can see with the purple being the deepest soil layer, moving up to orange on the graph at near the soil's surface. So as soil's water content 
A soil's water content is also a significant influence on its respiration levels and on the size of the soil pore space available to hold gaseous carbon dioxide. This makes it a necessary component to track if seasonal, a seasonal pattern is to be separated from its influence, since it can cause quite sudden shifts in carbon dioxide concentrations. So here is a workflow diagram of the initial data product. What it boils down to is accessing each organization's data product separately using their respective APIs and then processing the data to get compatible daily values that can be combined into a single data frame. At this point, the data sets can be used in parallel to create a graph for comparing seasonal patterns. So here's an example of what such a graph would look like. You can see the spike in photosynthetic activity, the GCC following spring leaf out reflected below in an increasing soil carbon dioxide concentration. There's also a concentration jump in the fall preceding a loss of green leaves indicated by a drop off in GCC. Such signals can be compared with those shown in soil temperature and water content to distinguish distinguish the influence of these environmental drivers. So this data product will provide a tool for researchers to get an initial look at how seasonal patterns for above ground and below ground processes in an ecosystem align. This will allow inference into which ecosystems will have the strongest signals and at what time of year the most significant changes are occurring. Ultimately, this data product can be expanded by utilizing the gradient method to model soil carbon dioxide movement throughout the soil profile and determine the seasonal soil respiration rate in relation to changes in photosynthetic activity. With that, I would like to thank NEON and the PhenoCam network for making their data freely available to the public and to make, for making this project possible. Uh, so that, are there any questions? Fantastic work, Paul. Um, looks like we have a question in the chat or a comment from Donald O'Leary. Very cool work. It looks like the soil moisture content does not linear is not very linear with depth, which makes sense depending on texture. Here's a link to a tutorial where you can view um, the, the vertical soil profile. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll check that out. Sorry, I don't have access to the chat right Yeah, now. it's hard when you're in presenter mode. But um, we definitely have time for a question or two for Paul. Feel free to unmute yourself. Paul, what do you think we could learn by scaling the analysis that you've done here? Um, as in like scaling to multiple sites or? Yeah, yeah well, I think one of the, the main values here is, uh, is that since this, these neon sites are across all of these main ecosystem types, it would give a ability to look at, okay, which ecosystems have the, this really strong seasonal signals and what time of year. So it might be that if you're looking at a drier ecosystem, um, there, you know, there's these strong signals between what's happening above ground and below ground. Uh, are only occurring when there's water available versus um, if it's strictly light limited um, as well. And so I think it's uh, being able to compare those different ecosystems would be the strength. I agree. I think that would be really interesting to look at, you know, across some say like bioclimatic systems or something to see some of those drivers by system. Really interesting. And also the the pipeline process should be the same for looking at other other wavelengths. So uh, like the, the red chromatic coordinate um, and all as well, um, which I believe is has been shown related to uh, tracking fall, fall changes and the loss of leaves. So mm -hmm. that could also be set up to compare with um, soil carbon dioxide concentration and see what those seasonal patterns look like. 
Definitely, like essentially litter fall and perhaps like legs in either timing or, or legs in, in that CO2 release. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you were already including in your research before this course, or is this sort of a project that has been altered or inspired by the INF 550 curriculum? So it's something I've, I might be moving towards doing a version of in my research, but uh, this course and having NEON and PhenoCam uh, data available would allow that to be expanded beyond looking at a single site in a single ecosystem. So being able to make larger comparisons. So uh, while I might be doing a similar process just at the one site I'm looking at, this would allow for uh, putting that site into kind of a greater, a greater context. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Any other questions for Paul? Okay, um, well, unfortunately, I think a portion of Flagstaff has lost power this morning, so we are going to shift the schedule a little bit, um, which means that next up we have Rohan Boone, who's going to speak on new metrics for annual scale climate memory in phenology using PhenoCam and NEON data. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. All good. Uh, can you see my first slide? Yes. Great, okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Duffy, and thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, like Dr. Duffy said, I'm Rowan Boone, and I'll be presenting my idea for a new metric to examine annual scale climate memory in phenological processes using data from PhenoCam and NEON. I'd like to give special thanks to our contacts from these infrastructures who took the time to virtually join us and uh, provide us with this awesome course alongside um, Dr. Duffy and Dr. Rettel. So phenological forecasting is critical for everything from agriculture to public health to tourism. Uh, climate warming though has made it more difficult to predict the timing of phenological events by shifting the beginning and, and the length of the growing season. Uh, one way we could potentially improve phenological predictions under climate change is to account for ecological memory. So ecological memory is the idea that current ecological processes are affected not only by current drivers, but by past conditions as well. For example, we know that peak greenness and the timing of spring onset are affected by recent temperature, but phenologists often overlook the potential impact of antecedent drivers such as last year's climate. One way we could potentially quantify ecological memory is by using the stochastic antecedent modeling framework. SAM is a statistical mixed effects model under a hierarchical Bayesian framework that can estimate not only the size of the effect of exogenous and endogenous drivers, but specifically quantify the relative importance of different time steps into the past. These importance weights can greatly improve our ability to predict future phenological timings given past climate by telling us exactly when conditions are most impactful. So in order to look at this from a phenological perspective, um, I decided to take data from PhenoCam, which provides high quality time series of canopy greenness as well as spring transition states based on a percentage of the maximum greenness amplitude. The spatial and temporal extent of PhenoCam could allow us to confidently estimate the effects of antecedent climate on canopy greenness across several ecosystems with different dominant vegetation types, expanding the usefulness of this data product greatly. So along with the PhenoCam data, uh, I've chosen single aspirated air temperature and precipitation data products from NEON. Uh, since PhenoCams are installed at most NEON sites, we essentially have climate data built in to our model and we can incorporate high quality measured not modeled data um, about climatological drivers into this Bayesian STAM model, which I'm talking about. And this is a really big advantage because there can be a lot of problems with model data. So here's the basic workflow. Um, I've 
collected metadata about co-located neon PhenoCam sites um, from the PhenoCam metadata via PhenoCam API. And then the, I took GCC 90 and transition date time series from PhenoCam R. The climate data were retrieved from the NEON sites of interest using the NEON utility packages. And all of the data are combined to be run in the SAM model, which in turn spits out the importance weights and their associated confidence intervals. So I haven't run the model, but uh, here's an example plot of what the importance weights might look like at annual and monthly scales. Uh, in this example, maybe precipitation might be more important further into the past, while temperature uh, has its greatest effects at the time of green up. Uh, we can pinpoint the time steps, either annual or monthly, um, that are most important to determining current phenology. And this could be a really powerful tool for helping us forecast future phenological states. So in summary, the spatial design and extent of NEON and PhenoCam make it exceptionally easy to incorporate these data together into a statistical model. And using this model, we'll be able to identify key time steps of interest at which antecedent climate greatly impacts current phenological processes and improve our ability to predict uh, the future phenological states of many different ecosystems. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Thank you, Rohan, that's a fantastic talk. Um, and we have some comments that you have fantastic plots, which I agree with, uh, nice work on that. Thank you. Um, so were you interested in phonology before taking this course? Does that um, relate to your dissertation work or did you get uh, interested in it through this course? Definitely interested. Well, I mean, to say I wasn't interested in it beforehand would probably be a little bit of a lie, but I definitely don't work with it. So it's a new sort of type of data, a new new concepts to be thinking about. Um, in my research, I generally look at tree ring data, uh, which lend themselves great to ecological memory. But I think that this model that I use, as well as just the idea of ecological memory, is something that is uh, really important and often overlooked. Definitely. So anything that, yeah, yeah, anything that it could potentially be affected by past states um, could be improved by, you know, looking at the, the memory of the system. Definitely. I, I really like how you took tree ring memory and applied it to phenological memory. It's a really interesting bridge. And I wonder um, if you think that you might at some point link both phonology and tree ring memory together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of an interesting field of study to look at, like the way that trees sort of prioritize what they do. And I think that it's sort of unknown, but one of the major theories out there is that tree rings sort of come last. So a tree will leaf out, to devote carbon to leaf out and storage before it ever uh, puts on new wood in the ring. So I would be really interested to see how that relates to the difference in memory between these phenological like green up leaf out processes and the timing of ring growth. Absolutely. It sounds fascinating. Do we have any questions for Rohan? And then we have quite a few phonology focused people on here. <laughs> If not, then next up we have Ethan Yakulik. I'm sorry, Ethan, I always butcher your last name. Um, but he is going to be talking about um, no more greener grasses tracking changes in phenocam greenness at rainwater manipulation experiments. Hi there, everyone. Sorry, I had some technical difficulties today. I actually did update my presentation since last class, but I'm having trouble turning it into a movie. So this will be very similar to what you saw on uh, Monday. Um, so thanks, Catherine. And thank you all for joining me today to talk about the results of my semester long project. Uh, my first introduction to this work actually came over a year ago when I was still working with Dr. Seth Munson at USGS. At that time, we had about a year of phenocamp data from a couple sites with ongoing rainwater manipulation experiments. 
I was unable to build a story from that data at the time, but I decided to return to the project a year later with more data and a better understanding of PhenoCam. Um, so with that, let's jump right in. The effects of anthropogenic climate change on global regional temperature are well understood. In the southwestern United States, temperatures are projected to increase significantly in the forthcoming century. There is less agreement, however, on what changes we can expect in the hydrological cycle in terms of total precipitation and seasonal distribu distribution. In Arizona, where pre precipitation follows a strong bimodal pattern of winter storms and summer monsoonal rains, changes in the duration or intensity of seasonal precipitation could have a dramatic effect on vegetation. In an attempt to simulate changes in vegetation composition and health, folks at USGS, NAU, and other institutions across the Southwest have been building rainwater shelters to manipulate summer precipitation. The picture on the right shows an example of a rainwater reduction shelter, um, whereas the general setup of this experiment can be seen on the left. For each site, there are a total of six plots split into the two treatment effects and a control group. Each plot is coupled with an individual phenocam to measure changes in GCC, which should theoretically tell us something about total greenness and productivity. In this study, I focused on two sites located within the Southwest Experimental Garden Array, which is referred to more commonly as SEGA. The first site, Blue Chute, is located north of Flagstaff near Red Mountain, while the Arboretum site is located just outside of Flagstaff off Woody Mountain Road. As you can see in the site characteristics, there's considerable variation in the elevation, vegetation composition, and general climates of these two sites. For the purposes of time, I'm just going to show you the time series of PhenoCam data from the Arboretum site, although many of the same features are also distinguishable at Blue Chute. Uh, the two panels show yearly normalized GCC values for 2019 and 2020 relative to the amount of precipitation that each treatment received. Values were normalized by the GCC value on the first day of the experiment for each year. And as you can hopefully see, there's a distinguishable trend in both years of data where the control and water addition plates have later peaks in MAC GCC values than the drought. Um, this is an outline of my general workflow. PhenoCam GCC values were separated by site, year, and plot, and normalized relative to each year's start date. Garden-specific weather data was integrated and used to construct GAMs for GCC norm at each site. And because I wanted to apply this work to future climate projections, I downloaded monthly gridded climate projections from CMIP and WorldClim, and I used these, the results of my GAM models to predict GCC under future and modern climate conditions, which you can see here. Um, in the top and bottom panels of these figures, you can see the comparisons of the climate variables from future and modern conditions with what we've had in 2019 and 2020. The middle plot shows the GCC values for each treatment type at each site overlaid with the fitted values from the World Clim and CMIP 5 projections. It seems likely that we still have some work to do with the, this model, but the hope is if we can tune this correctly, um, we can predict changes in GCC that could be really impactful in the future. And that brings me to my summary. Um, we had a very strange data set for these two years. Monsoonal precipitation was very low and temperatures were quite high. But the changes that we do see in these plots could say a lot about what future fire risk could be. Um, I'm excited to continue to work with this model because I think it has a great likelihood of being predictive in the future. And with that, here's a couple of time series of the plots at these two sites and my citations and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I'll ask one. So uh, can you review the different data sources that you integrated or you know, if there's another data source you'd like to bring in in addition in the future? Yeah, so I, I was able to, I primarily was relying on PhenoCam data and I integrated the CMIP5 and WorldClim data sources. And I also was able to pull um, local weather data from SEGA, which was provided by um, someone at NAU, Paul Heinrich. And I think in the future, I don't know, I've had some, some conversations with Catherine about um, potentially trying to extrapolate it to larger trends with using some satellite data, but I'm not sure how much sense that makes. I'm open to suggestions. Yeah, and Ethan, can you um, talk a little bit about 
how the phenocams integrate with this experiment. So you mentioned that there are there's water manipulation. Um, essentially, some some areas are receiving purposely less water, and some are receiving purposefully more. Is that correct? And then, do each of those various experiments have phenocams? Right. So um, yeah. So there's six plots at each site, and there's two drought treatments, two water additions, and two controls. So the droughts, the half of the water that it receives during a rainfall event are diverted into a holding tank. And the next time a field technician can come out, they then spray that water onto the water addition plots. And each of these plots has a camera that um, has the same angle and orientation, and it's taking a picture of the plot like this. And so hopefully what we would expect to see is in the rainwater plots, with the addition of extra water, there'd be more growth, more greenness that would be picked up by the phenocam. Definitely, that helps. And, and you also threw out a really interesting sort of bone in that you were wondering how this phenology might interact with fire. Can you talk about how phenology interacts with fire in the Southwest? Why, why would that be an important linkage for the future? Well, um, as, as I kind of touched on it in the early part of the presentation, we have these a pretty good understanding that there's going to be higher temperatures. Precipitation is less certain. But the effect of temperature alone is going to drive soil moisture to decrease. And as you move into the later parts of the summer, especially with having a weak monsoon like this year and last year, uh, your likelihood of fire is obviously going to go up. I mean, we can all see it in the grass outside, especially maybe a month or two again, it, two ago, it's, it's quite brown. Um, does that kind of get to what you were asking? Yeah, Kat? definitely sort of green up and brown down and the timing of brownness, right, is right. also a timing for increased fire risk. So that's really interesting linkage um, between like a larger scale process or disturbance and, and smaller scale like phen phenological shifts. Um, I have one last question just because this is a really interesting um, presentation with lots of fruit for, for further work. Um, so how do you think, so you mentioned that you had some anomalously dry and hot data. Um, how do you think that will impact uh, your ability to constrain future climate? Is that helpful, hurtful? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the interesting takeaways I had is, is if you, you know, I can pull this back a little bit, hopefully. Um, I guess not. Um, one of the big takeaways I had was that our, our T max from last year and our precipitation totals were completely uncharacteristic of the CMIP 5 data, which could potentially say that we are not fully constraining what climate projections could be in the Southwest. Um, obviously, you don't want to make um, assertions about climate based on two years of data, but we've had really atypical monsoons. And I think that could be really important to how we evaluate future conditions. Definitely. You got, right presently. Yeah, you got a dose of potential future climate. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And I hopefully we'll get a normal monsoon year. And as far as I can, as far as I understand, this experiment will be go ongoing for a couple years. So it'll be great to reevaluate this with a little bit more of a range of variability. Fantastic. Thanks, Ethan. Do you have any other questions for Ethan before we move on? If not, um, just again, due to some power struggles <laughs> in Flagstaff today, um, next up we have Emma Reich. Uh, she's going to be talking about using partitioned evapotranspiration to understand rapid ecosystem greenness dynamics. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, let me just share this. Um, so hello, everyone. I want to thank my collaborators first off. Um, uh, that's Kimberly Samuels Crow, Kiana Ogle, um, and Marcy Litvick from the University of New Mexico. In water limited ecosystems that are expected to experience higher rates of drought under climate change, it will be important to track how plants use water across the growing season and how this relates to greenness. 
Partitioning ET over different time scales is important to fully understand the ecohydrology of semi arid ecosystems with complex precipitation cycles. Evapotranspiration consists of two components, the abiotic process of evaporation and the biotic process of transpiration, in which plants lose water through their stomata during photosynthesis. Semi-arid ecosystems are characterized by summer monsoonal storms that cause heavy, sudden precipitation events after long, dry periods. These fast rainfall influxes cause a high spike in soil evaporation rates that often make transpiration patterns unintuitive. You can see at this site, evaporation really spikes up after um, a large precipitation event. Many people have used phenocamp greenness as a proxy for phenology to infer seasonality of plant water use, but comparisons with episodic precipitation data do not show us the whole picture. So what timescales does transpiration influence greenness? I asked this question at the desert shrubland and grassland sites located within the, within the Mackenzie Flats area of the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge in central New Mexico. I pulled eddy covariance flux data in half hourly re resolution and metadata from the Ameriflux website in order to partition evapotranspiration. The method I used is depicted on the graph to the right, which defines GPP as a predictor of ET using linear regressions of multi-year data. The y-intercept is the predicted amount of ET when there is no transpiration because GPP equals zero at this point, so we call the intercept the average evaporation. This method is applicable at water-limited sites when a linear regression between GPP and ET yields a positive intercept. I restructured this method to make it applicable at sub-yearly scales by downloading soil data from the USDA Soil Web Survey to use in a commonly used equation for soil evaporation that uses soil um, property data to calculate a soil resistance term and a wetness coefficient. This graph shows the field capacity, the amount of soil moisture held in the soil after excess water has drained at the grassland and shrubland sites. As you can see, more clay content allows soils to retain more moisture. I replaced the intercept in the evapotranspiration partitioning model with this mechanistic soil equation to force the model requirements to be satisfied, allowing us to correct for noise and use the model at weekly scales. Using this new model, I calculated transpiration averages along seven day sliding windows of time, which would allow us to compare plant transpiration rates in time with changes in plant greenness over specific growing seasons. I use the Phenocampy R package to pull one day Phenocamp green chromatic coordinate values, GGC, to look at how greenness fluctuates throughout the growing season and overlaps with the transpiration output from the model. Here you can see the plant greenness at the shrub site increasing throughout the late summer in 2018. This is the workflow I use for combining these data products. I use site metadata I downloaded from the Ameriflux website as inputs to find USDA National Resource Conservation Science soil data and use both Ameriflux and USDA data as inputs for the soil evaporation model. After additional EC flux data filtering, I ran the EC flux measurements and the soil evaporation model into the partitioning model workflow that made transpiration estimates usable at timescales to compare it to the phenocamp greenness that I pulled using the phenocampy R package. It is then possible to use transpiration estimates that were calculated in the partitioning model to assess how plants are using water throughout the growing season. When comparing the shrub and grass sites at Sevieta over the course of the 2017 growing season, we can see a lot less lag between plant physiology and greenness at the grass site compared to the shrub site. And these uh, two curves overlap a lot more or a lot better. In summary, partitioning ET using this method could help us understand lags between plant water use and greenness over the growing season using convenient data acquisition methods, such as flux towers and phenocams. Using a mechanistic soil model with, within a theoretical framework allows us to use EC fluxes at smaller scales, making flux measurements compatible with phenocam greenness estimates. I would like to thank all the infrastructures that contributed to this class, and I would now like to open this up for questions. I have a question. Oh yeah? Um, or just a clarification. So the, um, that plot you showed where the, the lag, um, like the curves seem to fit together, that was because you had incorporated the, the lag? Or, or um, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so going back, or these are two different sites at Sevieta. Um, so this is the shrub site and this is the grass site. So I was just mm. comparing how fast their physiologies responded to their water use. 
Oh, understood. So, so the shrubs are a little bit slower to green than the grasses. Gotcha. And do you know what time scale that is? Um, no, I have not done that okay. yet. <laughs> it looks like but maybe a week next or steps. a couple weeks. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Emma, I know that your dissertation work is focused on evapotranspiration and sort of partitioning that. Um, how is like how related is the the project that you did for this course to your research? Like, had you worked worked with PhenoCam data before, um, or Flux data before? So um, for my dissertation right now, I've mostly been working with um, Ameriflux data, um, and the model that I showed here is uh, what I've been working on for my dissertation. Um, and I, I guess, became more inspired by this class to use the phenocam data. Um, but I'm generally interested in like biotic and climatic drivers of plant water use um, and how that affects ecosystems in general. And where is your, I know when you're working with evapotranspiration data, um, where has your research generally been focused? Um, so right now working within uh, the New Mexico uh, elevation gradient. So that includes the Sevieta sites that I showed here um, and about four other sites um, that go up in elevation. Um, and they're also along an aridity gradient. So they're uh, useful to kind of test these like uh, these questions about plant water use. And have you considered, awesome, that's really interesting. And, and it's a really powerful data set that um, those Ameriflex towers across the elevational gradient. Um, have you thought about expanding this analysis to other regions? Um, right now, my evapotranspiration partitioning model only works at semi-arid sites. Um, so I guess it, it might be interesting to apply it to more semi-arid sites that have um, phenocams. Um, Sevieta is the only one within the, the gradient I'm currently working in that has a phenocam on it. Um, but yeah, that'd be an interesting question. Definitely. Thanks, Emma. Do we have any Thank other you. questions for Emma? So I, I put a message in the chat, um, but just as an update, we're going to hear from Gerilyn Poe next um, about factors influencing model performance for carbon exchange in the Arctic. Following that, we will hear from Yvonne Gonzalez, who's gonna talk about some new metrics for um, ecological integrity, and then we will have a 10 minute break. Um, so with that, I will let you take it away, Jarlyn. You can see it, right? Yes. Okay. So my name is Jarlyn Poe, and the work that I'll be presenting on today is a continuation of some work that I've been doing this summer. And so this summer I had an internship with NASA and I was working with the ABOVE program, which is the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment. And I'm really excited to be able to continue this project and especially be able to incorporate it into this um, class. And I want to acknowledge my advisor, Debbie Huntsinger, and also Catherine Duffy for their help with this project. And so to give an overview, as climate change brings increasing temperatures to the Arctic, carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere by permafrost thaw and wildfires. This exchange of carbon between the land and the atmosphere can be quantified with eddy covariance towers and models but there is often a mismatch between the two of them. This creates uncertainty in how ecosystems will evolve in the future and whether they'll act as carbon sources or sinks. And so when I started this research, I began with a model data comparison of net ecosystem exchange. And one of the major differences that I noticed between the models and the tower data was the timing of the peak carbon uptake. And so my question was how can time lag between models and flux, me flux measurements be improved by incorporating peak greenness and will that improve ecosystem models overall? And so for my research, um, I'm overall looking at several different sites within the above domain, but for the purposes of time, I'm just going to be focusing on one site, which is located in Northern Alaska, um, and it's Imnovate. And so the plot on the right shows the net ecosystem exchange from 2013 to 2017 at Imnovate with the black line being the tower measurement and then the rest of the lines being the several different models that I'm working with. And then where the red arrows are pointing, that indicates places where peak carbon uptake has those evident timing differences. And so I wanted to see if I could use phrenology to get a better timing agreement between the models and measurements. And so I used, I first started out by using the green chromatic coordinate from PhenoCam to look at the peak greenness at the site level. 
And then I moved to looking at MODIS NDVI to look at a larger spatial scale that better matched the models. Um, and then after that, I identified any time lags between peak greenness and peak carbon uptake. And then I used a change point detection in a piecewise linear model to see if the model data relationship strengthened with different timings of GCC and NDVI. And so these are my results from looking at PhenoCam. And so the yellow line is the GCC and the black line is the NEE from the tire measurement. And this shows that the timing of the peak greenness and the timing of the peak carbon uptake matched up well, um, but the model was a little bit offset. And so I used this, I used the same process for NDVI and I found that they also matched up well. That's found in the next figure in the next slide. Um, yeah, so that's the first figure. And then the second plot shows the piecewise linear fit compared with the model. And then the, um, the third figure, that's where I use the piecewise linear fit. And then I change the model's breakpoints to match up with timing of peak carbon uptake from the tower measurement. And then where I change those breakpoints, that's indicated by the yellow line in figure three. And so I wanted to be able to quantify this model improvement with these methods to, um, I could show that through a Taylor diagram. And so if you haven't seen a Taylor diagram before, it basically incorporates standard deviation, RMSD and correlation to show how the model compares with the tower measurement. And so how this plot works is the closer that the models are to the tower measurements is basically indicated by better performance. And so here in this case, the models that incorporated GCC and NDVI breakpoints performed better than the original model. Um, however, it should be noted that this work only used one model at one site, but so far the, look, the results look pretty optimistic. Um, in the future, I plan to incorporate at least seven more Arctic sites and at least five more models. But overall, this work shows that incorporating phenology into ecosystem models could help improve carbon exchange estimates specifically in the Arctic region. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. Fantastic work. Thanks, Jalen. Um, my first question is, could you um, talk about why, why we need to do these comparisons or validations or benchmarking, say, between flux towers and models? What purpose does that serve? I think that's important because, so flux towers measure a much smaller scale than models do. Here, I'll show this slides again. Um, so the flux towers show a much smaller scale of carbon exchange, but then models allow you to look at a much larger scale, which it helps in the Arctic region, especially because some of these places are remote and hard to get to. And so using models can enable us to be able to quantify carbon in those places where there aren't any covariance towers. Um, so yeah, the, I think it's just important that getting those models as close to the actual measurements as possible is um, a major goal right now. Right, and the Arctic is experiencing quite rapid change, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so perhaps like understanding, um, <clears throat> understanding perhaps how accurate the models are um, or, or some sort of leg or offset or ways that we could constrain those models, I would think yeah, would be exactly. quite important for predicting climate change. Do we have any other questions for Gerilyn? Really fantastic work with the change point detection model. I'm really impressed by the amount of data that you've integrated here. Um, okay, so we have a question from Donald. Uh, great presentation. If I'm understanding correctly, you're using the Ameriflux observations as quote unquote truth, and then allocating any difference between the measurements and the models as model error. Is it possible that the models are capturing some phenomena that the measurements don't observe, i.e. can we assume the measurements to be comprehensive quote unquote truth? Great question, Donald. Yeah, I, I think like I recognize that the uh, tower measurements aren't exact, but I think that's probably one of the best estimates that we have right now. And so that's why I just calculated, or that's why I said that was the truth quote. Great. 
Great, thanks, Jarlyn. Uh, do we have any other questions before we go to our final presentation before the break? Okay, thanks a bunch. Um, yeah, thanks, Catherine. Last for this section, uh, we have Yvonne Gonzalez, and he's gonna be talking about an ecological integrity index based on temporal remotely sensed data. Let me just make sure that, yes, Yvonne is here and ready. Sorry, it was mute. So can, can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Well, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ivan Gonzalez, and I'm going to show a proposal from a remote sensor based index that is attempting to monitoring and detecting integrity loss or degradation in tropical ecosystems, mainly. So, well, maybe some of you like me uh, are waiting to detect some critical changes into the ecosystems sometimes after that occurs. So maybe here with this approach, we can try to identify those changes before then a hard or strong change happens. So the core concept in this project is the integrity which is a measure of the natural conditions from the ecosystems, which are in some way able to be measured from remote sensing data. And um, current data sets allow us to characterize or extract some traits for those ecosystems. This is very useful for countries where we don't have instruments in the ground or, or we don't have the capacity to monitoring or protect all the area. So, Considering, uh, for example, in this case, NASA Earth observation information, we can consider a given ecosystem and a conserved locations in that given ecosystem. And using imagery, we can derive how the pools or the dynamics from that for those ecosystems. So this information have a spatial expression, but also temporal, and it's important to aggregate them in different time frames. For example, in this graph, we have different places. We have different trends, different variants, but all they have the same mean. So in order to avoid that, we want to generate a bunch of curves that describe the pools or the integrity of, of each ecosystem. So this is how the integrity looks for a given place in Colombia. And we have the long-term integrity this plot here shows how it looks a typical month, all the months, and here we have a how it looks a typical year. So we can establish a simple equation that allow us to measure certain anomalies. And thus, those anomalies are the way that we can to identify the integrity loss in our ecosystems. So the way that we can measure and provide some numbers to that integrity is starting from uh, three very important inputs, which are uh, sample sites where we do know that are conserved sites and ecosystems layers and imagery. So we will uh, combine all these three uh, data sources in order to get all the curves that I showed you before. So this is the pipeline where we will combine all the data set to provide the curves in these boxes, which are the main product of this analysis. And after that, we will compare those curves with new observations. So for this project, I combine a Google Earth Engine API with Azure Virtual Machines. I deploy a kind of dashboard, let's say, or a host that will combine all the curves with new observations and generate a kind of interactive dashboard. So this is how it looks uh, the information. We will combine, uh, for example, for a given pixel, we will know how it should look in the, in the past, in the future, but also how, how we're in a given term range, how the information should look like, looks like, sorry. And additionally, a map. So 
quickly, I will show you this um, dashboard that we create for this project. So we will, you will have the link for this. So in the first tab, we have a little description of how the integrity is measured and how it's understood in this context. We will have uh, some examples of the curves that I told you before. For example, this is a super dry ecosystem in Colombia. And this is the most rainiest forest in the world. So we notice that there is a change. I use a two sample sites in Colombia, Amazon and, Ecos and Janus. Those points here show the training and observing locations. And as you can see here, we have a different trend and different pattern with conserve conserved and degraded places, as well as the monthly and annual curves that you can download for your use. And additionally, finally, uh, there's a proxy that we can take those curves and, for example, compare with another uh, pixel. So this is the, how the Amazon looks like in terms of NDVI. And if we want to, for example, compare how it looks a given place, I will click here randomly and extract Google Earth Engine information. We will have their curves in a couple seconds on the top. In the same way, we will we can derivate a maps to analyze all region. And I guess the time is done. So just to finish, we can draw a polygon here and submit the query for a short time period. And okay, error. So forget that part. <laughs> and uh, Finally, uh, the final steps for the research is trying to validate these algorithms with um, ground information. In tropical countries, we don't have neon, amari flux, or something like that, but we need to try to validate or find some statistical way to get um, a way to, to say that this is a good index for monitoring the ecosystems. So I will tell you this link in the chat, just to check. Fantastic work, thanks, Ivan. Um, it would definitely be interesting to look at some of the Ameriflux data because there are some towers down there, though I know they are quite challenging to run in tropical ecosystems just due to the canopy height and things like that. Um, and I really appreciated you showing us your application um, because, and, and it's always the worst when you try to demo an app application live, it's always when it breaks. <laughs> so <laughs> it's happened to me many times. Um, <laughs> But before we break, I'm wondering if um, we have any questions for Yvonne. Um, but yeah, I, we had got a comment that you have beautiful graphics. I totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks like you dropped us a link to your application, which is fantastic. Um, do we have any questions for Yvonne before we take a short break? Okay, um, then with that, uh, the current time by my clock is 11.04. So I will um, put up a 10 minute break slide. Um, we will reconvene at um, 11.14 and we will sort of do some rearrangement of people who had power outages who are now available um, to talk about some really fantastic um, derived data products. So with that, um, feel free to stay on, unmute yourself in chat if you have any questions for the presenters. Um, otherwise, we'll begin again at 11.14. Hello, my name is Laura Puckett and I'm part of the Geode Lab here at NAU. Today I'll be talking about my project, combining ground and airborne measurements for black spruce mapping. This work includes preliminary steps for a black spruce fractional cover map mapping project across the North American boreal forest that will be the focus of my dissertation. By now you may, might be wondering, why is it so important to map black spruce? Well, existing maps for the region that are a finer resolution than 250 meters only differentiate to broad categories of deciduous evergreen and mixed forest. Black spruce forests are more, oh, yet we know that vegetation fire interactions and carbon storage vary by species. 
black spruce forests are more flammable than other forest types and are characterized by deep carbon rich organic soil, a sink of carbon that might be threatened by changes in fire regime. Um, I think this should be advancing. I'm, I'm not sure why it's not. We're, we're not seeing it advance yet. Okay. You can click on it though, if it, that's better. Um, you may have right. to see them. Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Okay, so additionally, it is hypothesized that a large scale shift from black spruce to other species is also occurring due to changes in fire regime. Large scale black spruce cover mapping would allow investigation of these fire vegetation interactions in a spatially explicit way. Mapping black spruce fractional cover at a large scale will require availability of consistent data sets throughout the region. Data from NASA's above airborne campaign is ideally suited as predictors for this modeling effort. The figure on the right displays extensive coverage of both Elvis LiDAR data and Avera's hyperspectral data. I will eventually incorporate many field measurements spread throughout this region for the modeling effort. In this project, I focused on preliminary work with the data sets at a NEON terrestrial site. The NEON site is a great place to start because the availability of so many kinds of data at multiple scales makes it possible to investigate possible questions that may arise when aligning the field and remote sensing data. Um, woody plant vegetation structure measurements from the Caribou, Caribou Poker Creek's research watershed neon site will be used as ground truth. The values of interest are tree inventory measurements that include species, location, and stem diameter. I calculated the pr proportion of total basal area that was comprised of black spruce for each 400 meter squared sam sampling area. The next data set is LiDAR data collected with ELVIS, the land vegetation and ice sensor. These measurements are large footprint LiDAR data with each measurement representing about an, an area of about 10 meter diameter circle on the ground. This data set provides information about forest structure in the form of relative height as a function of cumulative return energy. Each footprint contains about 25 different percentiles of return energy as plotted on the right. These measurements are provided as text files, and I downloaded them using a Python script provided by the National Snow and Ice Data Center DAC, where the data are stored. The other data set that I'll be using from the NASA Above Airborne campaign is the Avariz NG hyperspectral data. These data include reflectance values at 5 meter spatial and 5 nanometer spectral resolution. These data come as a 300 plus band raster in NV format. The image that I use for this project is shown on the left, which I retrieved using wget, the command line tool. The image on the right shows the reflectance for a few pixels. I hope that the high number of spectral bands in these data will help to discriminate spectral signatures of different tree species. Here I will go through my derived data product pipeline. The top panel includes steps that I have completed as part of the project, and the bottom includes remaining steps. For each of my three data sets, I started by downloading data in my general area of interest for each data product. Downloading methods use, included using the NEON API, a Python script, and wget. Once I had the raw data, I advanced to the pre-processing step for each data set using R statistical software. For the NEON data, this required identifying sampling areas for the measurements of interest and then subsetting for those. For Elvis and Avers, I converted the data into rasters and obtained weighted area weighted average values. Then I joined all three data streams into a single data set. In future work, I will incorporate more sites and identify additional derived metrics and indices that I can include as predictors. Then I will implement a variable selection method and train the model. I expect there will be iteration on these steps before I select a final model. Once I have that model, I will map black spruce fractional cover and assess the accuracy of the map. Here is a visualization of how I spatially summarized and combined the data sets. This required converting the data into spatial formats that could be clipped by plot boundaries and then so that I could then take an area weighted average for the remote sensing measurements and add the total basal area of each species per plot for the forest inventory data. I retained plot identifier information for plot level summaries from each data product to allow the results to be joined into a single table. After filtering for plots with sufficient coverage by all three data sets, I was left with 13 sites. 
In this project, I developed a workflow to spatially summarize and join three data streams for a black spruce mapping effort. I will continue to incorporate other sites throughout the domain in order to develop a more comprehensive data set for model training and testing. The eventual map will be used to study interactions between black spruce forest cover and fires that are currently playing out in the North American boreal forest across space and time. Thank you. Here are my data references and I will happily take any questions. Thanks, Laura, and thanks for being so flexible with <laughs> everything going wrong today <clears throat> um, with power and everything. That was a fantastic presentation, and I'm really impressed. Um, so can you talk about, I know that this relates to your dissertation work, but how is the work that you've presented here, like how, how has it changed as a, as a function of being in the INF 550 course? Um, so... Definitely thinking about neon data was, um, I think that was like the key change that I saw in my research um, plan. So I was not really aware of all the, um, yeah, just how to access the data, how to use it. And so even though there are a lot of other sites that I will be incorporating um, for the modeling effort that are but more spatially representative of the entire area that I'm modeling over. Um, my decision to use a neon site to start this um, workflow. And um, yeah, that was heavily influenced by being a part of this class. Great. So do you think you'll continue to use some of those neon sites in the future? Yeah, I'm definitely in your in your dissertation. Yeah, research? I'll definitely use um, the, I think I said there were 13 that um, had good coverage of all the data sets from this bonus site right now. But that was only with a couple years of NEON data that are currently available for that site. Um, so I think once the rest of the measurements are uploaded, um, that will probably double. And yeah, so I'll at least use those sites. Um, and then I might also incorporate other data sets to kind of explore these um, at what scale I'm trying to summarize everything um, because there's the flexibility to um, to aggregate these measurements at different plot sizes at NEON because there are um, locations and different subplot IDs for them. Definitely yeah it's NEON has an impressive data set and I agree that it it's helpful to sort of work through all the data and how to get how to access them and all of that. Um, and you just sort of realize what a Pandora's box is out there <laughs> um, to work with. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been really impressive integration of a lot of the data and methods that we've or data and um, data sets and, and infrastructures that we've covered. So very impressed. All right. Um, do we have any questions for Laura? Okay, um, and thanks everyone for being flexible with everything shifting around. Um, so we're kind of jumping all over the schedule. Um, but next up, we have Melissa Rose, who's gonna be speaking on creating a digital elevation model of the Sierra Ancha Experimental Forest to improve US Forest Service mission critical communication objectives. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Rose. Um, um, I, I'm a first year PhD student and take these remote sensing and geoinformatics lab. And my term project for this class was born out of a more applied request, I guess, for my study site, the Sierra Ancha Experimental Forest, to help automate data availability for the site. Um, and my collaborators for this project are Peggy Sinke, my advisor, Jackson Leonard, the lead ecologist for the site, and Paul Heinrich, our field engineer. So the Sierra Ancha Experimental Forest is located in the Tonto National Forest, which is just northeast of Phoenix. And the Forest Service has managed the Sierra Ancha Experimental Forest for about a century now, uh, almost 100 years. And they've collected a variety of long-term monitoring data, including watershed management data, climate research data, and climate change data. Um, but currently, however, the data collected by the, the site 
um, is manually uploaded. And of course, I would like to invest in infrastructure to automate data collection and transmission efforts. So currently, Sierra Ancha has four weather stations distributed across 4,000 uh, 4, foot elevation gradient. And the Rippling Creek watershed, which is a historic experimental watershed, is also equipped with four weirs, um, each with data loggers that collect technology data for each tributary, as well as the main dam. Um, but however, establishing a wireless connection to automate data collection and transmission efforts has proven to be a challenge given the uh, site's top topography and the widely dispersed nature of these, where these instruments are located. Um, so the first service is had an electrical engineer to connect these instruments to receivers. And as a first step in this process, I created a digital elevation model using the Aster uh, GDEM uh, product. And I chose Aster as opposed to some other publicly available um, digital elevation models. Uh, one for the spatial resolution, because it's at 30 meter resolution, which is better than some others. Um, and I chose it over the SRTM model because um, the SRTM uses radar, which um, is less uh, vertically accurate. Um, so it, the values represent the elevation of the first reported surface. So quite often tree plus, not the actual um, elevation metrics. Um, I'm going to just click over here with that. Um, I also um, use the KML file for the site that has um, a bunch of different locations. So these are if you're looking at the different locations of where the weather stations are located. So they kind of go up this elevation gradient starting at the bottom. Um, this is where the third weather station is located, kind of mid elevation. And then up at the top here at Aztec, we can get a fourth weather station. Um, and then as we head down the watershed, um, these are where our weirs and our, yeah, our four weirs for the tributary of the main dam are located. Um, so using uh, the GDM, which I pulled uh, through uh, the appears API request uh, using R, um, I pulled that in. I had to create a shape file first uh, for the extent of the um, for uh, the extent of the site, and then I uh, converted the KML file into a shape file for our, the locations of the instruments that we want to target. Um, imported all these into ArcMap, edited, um, did some some data editing, and then use several different spatial analyst tools to calculate important metrics for the model that we're going to be using to decide where to place the receivers. So here's just a quick um, snapshot of the final products. So first here in the first panel, we have the digital elevation model. Um, the second one here are values for slope, with red being areas of high slope, uh, high values for slope. Third here is aspect. So this just lets us know which, which way the slope is facing. And then the fourth panel here, is our solar radiation metrics. Um, and so uh, all of these, these metrics, these rasters are important for our next step, which would be to model um, where to place the infrastructure. And, oops, sorry, I think I missed a slide. Um, so yeah, so next steps uh, are for us to work together to model the locations of the instruments and receiving equipment. Um, and to do this, I'll be working, well, I'll be working, it's technically myself, Psychologist and our, our field engineer, Paul Heiner. And um, in summary, uh, while well, this is just a first step getting these, these raster data, um, data products derived from the Aster GDEM, uh, it'll be useful for the Forest Service and help, helping make informed decisions about how best to improve their data infrastructure and their mission critical communication objectives. Um, so, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And this is just another quick overview of where all these instruments are located. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, first, we had a comment from Donald O'Leary at NEON. Um, he said, wow, I didn't know that the SRTM has such poor vertical accuracy. I will rethink my use of those data in the future. Can you comment <laughs> on that vertical accuracy? Um, yeah, sorry, give me one second. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, when I was digging around a little bit, I did, I did notice that there, um, there was that discrepancy there. Um, yeah, is that, is that more of a comment or is there a question involved with that, Donald? I think more a comment <laughs> I'm gonna take, okay. Just a remark, 
So, okay, perfect. Um, well, but I'll ask a question about it. So how should we think about that data set with its poor vertical accuracy? I think, well, I think in some ways it can be helpful if you're looking at, at Canopy, if you wanted to look at um, metrics for, for those first return values for, for Canopy cover, but um, in terms of just our, our elevation model, um, we wanted to obviously get the ground returns or have something that, that models that uh, in a better way. So um, that's kind of how I, I took it in, in looking around in which, which GDM to use. Definitely. And so I know that this derived data product actually ended up stemming from a pretty immediate need. Um, can, yes. you, can you talk about that a little bit, how, how this derived data product came to be? Yeah, so I mean, originally I was planning on um, calculating bird ratios using neon AOP data because um, I am a big fan of, <laughs> of neon, having um, worked with them on the NSF side in the past. Um, and at the last minute, uh, we, we just had a more immediate need. My I field site had a, a more immediate need. So um, I pivoted at the last second and decided to, um, to change gears and use that, that digital elevation model to serve the needs of my, my study site and, and move forward. And, um, and improving the, the data collection efforts at SAEF because, um, yeah, there, there, so there are multiple different stream gauges in, at SAEF. Some of them are operated by USGS. Some of them, uh, I think there's another stream gauge that's operated by another uh, agency. And so the ones that are operated by the forest system themselves are the last um, stream gauges that are not um, automated to just automatically up to upload data. So, um, so this is hopefully going to get all the data up and, up and running and be able to stream more efficiently. Fantastic, thanks. Do, do we have any other questions? Okay, um, then with that, we'll move on to Jenna Kinney. Uh, she's gonna be talking about uh, in investigating variations in forest metrics between Jedi and Elvis LIDAR and African forest strongholds uh, in Gabon. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Can you hear me okay? Okay, my name is Jenna Keeney, as Catherine mentioned, and I work in Chris Dowdy's Megabiota Lab here at Northern Arizona University. Um, we study how mega herbivores impact their surrounding environments. And in this project, I'm interested in how African forest elephants affect forest metrics in Gabon, which is one of the last strongholds of these forest elephants in Central Africa. So African forest elephants um, face severe threats from poaching with estimated losses of 60 to 80% from 2002 to 2013. Um, they are cousins of the African savanna elephants inhabiting dense tropical, or inhabiting dense tropical forests in Africa. Um, they're difficult to study due to the intraversible nature of their environment. However, it is known that they play a vital role in seed dispersal and nutrient transfer. However, how do they impact canopy structure? Through browsing and knocking over trees, it is known that they can significantly impact forest density. I hope to use remote, remotely sensed LIDAR or light detection ranging to quantify elephants' role as ecosystem engineers. To do this, I compared two LIDAR datasets, Elvis and Jedi, in Lope National Park in Gabon, which is circled in red um, right over here. This map was um, created from one of our collaborators, Boo Mazels of the Wildlife Conservation Society. So LIDAR provides important forest structure data for areas that are difficult to study. However, JEDI or the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation is a new sensor collecting global LIDAR from the International Space Station. It provides full waveform LIDAR, which is first released in 2019 with 30 meters of resolution. Um, this is just an image showing some of the Jedi uh, data overlapping our Lope field site. So using um, Elvis or the land vegetation and ice sensor, on the other hand, um, is also full waveform LIDAR, but it's collected from an airplane. Um, and it was collected in Gabon through the NASA AFRISAR campaign in 2016. And it does have about 18 meters of resolution. So there's one issue here of combining Elvis and Jedi is the temporal um, differences. So we have from 2016 to, to about 2019 or 2020, which is one, one issue, but it is um, both collected in national parks, so there shouldn't be too many differences. Um, so here's my workflow showing how I downloaded each LIDAR data set. I used a peers from LPDAC to download JEDI and NSIDC for Elvis. I then created a distance matrix between the two and selected the closest Elvis point to each JEDI shot. 
I joined these two data sets together and analyzed them in R. From there, I was able to take the difference between Jedi and Elvis estimates of both canopy cover and canopy height. I also ran a Man Whitney U test for each metric. This is the histogram from the difference in canopy cover from Jedi to Elvis. You can see there are some big differences. However, most of these are found in the 0 to 0 0.2 range. The Man Whitney U test showed a significant difference between the two data sets as well, with a high, significantly high p value or low p value, excuse me. Um, so high significance. Um, next, we have the histogram of the canopy height between Jedi and Elvis. There were also some noticeable differences here between the canopy height for each of these data sets in Lope. Um, however, there were few with extreme differences of that 30 plus meters um, of difference in canopy height. So these would be interesting to look at in the future. The Man Whitney U test is also st statistically significant in this um, comparison. So in conclusion, there were high variations um, in both canopy cover and canopy height between the two LIDAR data sets. This could be due to the fact that there are some known georeferencing issues in JEDI. However, these will hopefully be fixed with the next output of data from JEDI. Um, the differences are known to be about 10 meters. So that could be where the differences come from between ELVAs. Continued validation and analysis are needed for JEDI. Um, if we are to use this data set to quantify elephant um, impact in, in other forests, such as the DRC or Cameroon. So lastly, I wanted to touch on the conservation impacts of this research. Um, determining the optimal LIDAR data set for quantifying elephant impact on forest structure will help, us will help us determine their role as ecosystem engineers. If we can conclude that elephants are necessary for the structure and health of forests, we can hopefully raise conservation awareness. There have also been previous studies that show forest elephants increase carbon storage, which we could confirm with global LIDAR from JEDI. So thank you so much, and I will now take any questions. And here are my references. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, so, we already have a question in the chat um, from Donald, who we know is <laughs> very passionate about Jedi. <laughs> yeah. uh, he says, very interesting work. I'm curious about how you paired up Elvis and Jedi. What was the average maximum linear distance between the shots that you're comparing? And how does that relate to spatial heterogeneity of the forest itself? Yeah, so I, I only took Elvis um, shots that were within about 12.5 meters of Jedi shots. And from there, I took the closest Jedi to Elvis. So there were no, um, you know, Elvis points that were more than 12.5 meters away from the Jedi. Um, so that's definitely one thing that I tried to, to make sure I did. And I know that the comparison, you know, is going to be difficult between these two, even in 12.5 meters, but there is the difference in resolution between those two, those two data sets. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Wow, okay, that's way closer together than I was thinking. Awesome, thanks, is what Tom no said problem. in Yeah, sorry, I can't really see the chat right now. <laughs> I know, that's why I'm reading it for you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so having worked with Elvis and um, Jedi together, what recommendations would you have for people who are trying to marry those data? Um, I would say, I mean, just, just keep at it. And honestly, the the thing that I learned from this analysis and this study was there's so much to be done and there's so much to, to continue to look at. I feel like I just dove into it really. Um, and luckily I'm doing this for my dissertation. So I have plenty of time. Um, and hopefully maybe I'll, I'll get in contact with Donald and we can work together. Um, but I would say, you know, start the pre-processing early, you know, getting the, the two data sets to overlap and finding those, those points that are close together and making sure they look okay and, you know, checking for abnormalities takes longer than you think. Absolutely. True with any, <laughs> with any integration yes. across sources. Always challenging. But yeah. we got a thumbs up from Donald that you two should work together. I agree. All right. Sounds good. Okay, do we have any other questions? Then with that, we'll move on to Cameron Bodine and he's gonna be talking about estimating um, GBH or diameter at breast height from neon AOP LIDAR.
had trouble finding the mute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Duffy, and a special thank you to all of our jo guests joining us today. I will be presenting a diameter at breast height or DBH data product derived from the NEON terrestrial observation system and aerial observation platform. The primary objective of this data product is to provide a quantitative approach to estimating DBH, which will inform restoration prescription plans. Ponderosa pine forests around Flagstaff are extremely dense, presenting significant fire risks to adjacent communities. To alleviate this risk and restore density to historic levels, the Nature Conservancy has partnered with the U.S. Forest Service to develop and implement thinning prescriptions. The prescriptions are generated from prism-based estimates of DBH, which can be subject subjective and variable. I propose a model to estimate DBH from forest structural metrics from LIDAR that will provide systematic and repeatable method to estimating basal area. This project used data from Neon Soap Root Saddle or Soap Site in California, as this location has many ponderosa pines. Woody plant vegetation structure from the terrestrial observation system was used. This data product includes structural measurements of individual trees. Individual measurements of DBH were used for ground-based validation. Ponderosa pines at soap plot 48 were used to fit a model, while soap plot 54 was used to test the model. The discrete return LIDAR point cloud from the airborne observation platform for soap were used to calculate for structural metrics. These data represent the X, Y, and Z locations for each laser return. NEON's LIDAR data have a coverage of approximately four points per square meter, with a point having up to five returns. The density of that laser return allow for accurate calculation of forest structural metrics. Both data sets were acquired using the NEON Utilities R package. The woody plant structure data were queried to determine sites and plots with ponderosa pines. LIDAR intersecting the plots were then downloaded. The lighter package was used to calculate two meter grid based structural metrics, which were then intersected with the plant data. Finally, a model was fit using top five subsets of covariates as determined with reg subsets function in the leaps package. The fitted model had a reasonably high adjusted R squared of 0 0.76, a very small P value and a prediction min max accuracy of 71%. From the anomaly plot, we can see that the model consistently overestimated DBH for small trees and underestimated for larger trees. 33% of the predictions were within five centimeters of observed DBH and 66% were within 10 centimeters. This project shows that DBH can be predicted from structural metrics derived from LIDAR point clouds, but more work is needed. I recommend that the Nature Conservancy pursue larger plot level measurements of DBH and basal area to inform their model development, as smaller trees are often massed at high stand densities. Once validated, the model will help TNC and the Forest Service to reliably thin forest to their historic levels and alleviate that fire risk. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Thanks, Cameron. I have a question. So, so you mentioned your, some of your earlier graphics showed fires that we're dealing with locally here around Flagstaff. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about like how, say, soap, I know it's a ponderosa pine forest, but how soap can inform our, say, forest management or risks here. Sure. Um, I, I saw the, the opportunity to use NEON data um, since I had both the ground-based measurements of individual tree diameters, as well as those aerial-based measurements of um, LIDAR to be able to uh, essentially beta test a model to see if it, if it could actually work. Um, TNC is actively collecting um, DBH across the forest, and they're also collecting uh, LIDAR data um, from a drone. And so they use a canopy height model to kind of visually interpret uh, that, that data to try and inform their prescriptions. But I was thinking that if they used more of a 
quantitative model-based approach, they might be able to more quickly create these uh, uh, prescription plans more accurately as well. Absolutely, and we have a question from Donna O'Leary. He says, cool stuff, thanks Cameron. How do you think that your model would be challenged by various treatments such as fuel thinning versus, or like dog hair thicket forests? Um, yeah, I think it definitely would be challenged if you're looking at um, uh, forests with uh, higher diversity. Um, for, for the forests around here, however, um, they are predominantly um, ponderosa pines. <clears throat> and so I think there's good opportunity to uh, essentially get a good measurement of those, those trees. But I think uh, having a larger variety of species uh, diversity definitely throws a wrench um, in, in this modeling. But that could be somewhere where uh, additional remote sensing using like hyperspectral imagery to try and get down to a, a classification of individual trees um, could start to help. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, definitely. Um, Donald says those are really great thoughts. And I also um, wonder if you could throw some sort of method like a recurrent convolutional neural network or something like that at the data in order to ingest some really fine imagery or something like that. Um, I know it's been quite successful in California, um, but I think has yet to be tested in Arizona, for example. Um, yeah, and I, I have a, a strong interest in, in looking into those methodologies more for my own research. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I do believe there's a lot of opportunity there to, to throw some, some more meat at, at this problem. Yeah, but it's, it's very much needed um, kind of circling back to some of the fire stuff that David Falling pre um, presented in the beginning is that, you know, this year we didn't have a lot of fires, but we saw quite a few in California and it's, um, it's very helpful to understand ecosystem structure and understand what sort of treatments need to be completed and, um, and all of that. And we also had a question from, from Rohan. He said, is this something that can be done annually to detect changes in DBH from year to year or is it not precise enough? Um, I think uh, definitely more data and, and looking uh, analysis would be required to, to get down to that level. Um, uh, yeah, and, and that's where I think some of these uh, uh, TNC operations, they could start to look at that because they, they are actively um, flying these data with drones and they're also um, flying pre-harvest and post-harvest. And so there would be good opportunity to see changes from that as well. Fantastic, thanks. Um, Rohan says, thanks, repeat DBH <laughs> measurements are a pain. Yeah, I agree. I think the <laughs> other thing that is though interesting about having annual measurements um, is you can start to get at some uncertainty metrics, right? Either from the drones and or from the DBH measurements themselves and start to really understand um, your, your accuracy. Exactly. And that's, that's why I recommend, um, sort of scaling up the footprint, like the, the two meter grid based approach, it was a, a bit too fine, but, um, I needed to get down to that level because the, the point spacing of the trees that were measured were, were pretty, pretty dense. And so I was trying to get, uh, basically a one-to-one -one relationship between a, a grid cell and a, and a point, but. Challenging, challenging, but, but worthwhile. Yeah. Okay, so we actually have three presentations left to wrap up our Ignite session, um, just all the rearranging and, and all of that. Um, we're sort of deviating from the schedule, um, but we will have Hao Wang um, up next talking about exploring the impacts of wildfire to ecosystems followed by Blaise Lasala and then Scooter Novak to as our last Ignite um, presentation. And then we will have some general discussion. So thanks everyone for being patient and flexible as we're navigating <laughs> Zoom plus power outages, et cetera. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Hal. Uh, hello, doctor. Uh, is my voice clear? Uh, a little muffled and maybe make sure you go to presentation mode but um yeah yeah sure yeah okay we'll start 
All right, uh, hello everybody. My name is Hao, and uh, today I would like to share my little experience on wildfire research. So, uh, wildfire is a phenomenon that happens, usually happens. It happens every day, maybe everywhere, and it usually causes death of the roof, uh, which is horrible. So, that's why I decided to explore the impact of wildfire to the ecosystem. So, my workflow here is to um, find a burning area. From, from the Google Earth engine first, and then check the, check the data with the neon sites and then use their, uh, compare their derived data products, and then to find changes on the vegetation index, surface temperature, biodiversity, and then finally conclude if, if a wildfire ha heavily impact a ecosystem. So I found a wildfire from the Google Earth engine that happens last February on uh, Georgia. So I also got the data from the photo cam at the same day, but uh, it's still unknown how long it lasts because uh, all the data from the February since lost. So I would guess it's uh, maybe a couple of days, maybe a few weeks. So also I compared the uh, photo cam data to previous year, which is 2018. And um, then I found the high resolution mosaic of the same, at the same location from the Leon AOP, but uh, it's, hard, it's hard for human eyes to find the change between those two different pictures. So I checked the NGVA from the NASA EOS. Uh, unfortunately, the, what the data told us is there's nothing abnormal when compare the data to the previous year. So I just back to the field cam focused on a smaller area, I check the GCC, which is uh, another form to represent the vegetation index. I found there is a little gap between um, February and April because all those data during this time interval is lost. Uh, even they have, the value is pretty low because everything is burnt to ash. However, uh, when time comes to the April, um, you can see on the curve, everything just back to normal. Uh, it seems like nothing is happening. So just keep going to find the LiDAR point cloud from the Neon AOP that's collected by the hyperspectral remote sensing equipment. And I generate the 3D model at the same location from different time. I found that the 2019 has a much lower uh, vegetation coverlet. I the canopy height model also told me the same result. And the, when I check the canopy height model factor, uh, there's just one thing that is very different, uh, which is deep gaps. So according to this page, deep gaps is defined as a cover and the openness. So, which means the 2019 has a much lower vegetation coverlet uh, because there was a wildfire before. So again, I just uh, took more data, the land surface temperature from the NASA EOS. Uh, still, there is no evidence shows that the data at this time interval is abnormal when compared to the previous, previous year. So my conclusion here is a wildfire that happens in a, a small area. Uh, it's like, it's pretty normal. It's a, like a cycle of nature, a deep freeze. Uh, even, even it's a huge, a severe wildfire. Uh, if we take strategies immediately, there would be almost no impact to the local ecosystem. So uh, the contribution is, I think that is a um, good model to which keeps growing and helps people who would like to research wildfires in the future. And all the all those data I use is basically comes from our courses, our coding lab. For the quality control, what I did is basically filter those uh, using as data points and apply the scale and the normalization to the original data to make it look better. So that's what I almost uh, did for this project. Uh, Vic, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to help.
Thanks, Hao. That's a really great use of a lot of different data sets and methods yeah. that we've used in this course. I, I really like the combination of like PhenoCam and some of the structural diversity stuff. Um, so were you, I didn't quite catch it. Um, were you able to look at changes in structural diversity pre and post fire? Uh, yeah, so all those uh, results indicate that uh, there's- Okay, gotcha, yeah. yeah. yeah there's no big impact to the local There ecosystem. wasn't a big impact. Right. So um, from, the, from the NASA EOS data, did it give you any sort of metric for fire severity? Um, I checked the land surface temperature, also the smoke, uh, the haze factor, the smoke, um, but all, all those data indicates uh, nothing. But I, I would like to share my TOS data, but I'm really not good at that. So I picked up data that is more spacious. Uh huh. Yeah. So just um and thanks for um <laughs> entertaining my questions even though they were in your graphs so i just am juggling quite a few things at the same time but um but yeah so do you think if you um analyzed a more severe fire you would see more canopy height differences or other structural diversity metrics uh yeah yeah that's what i'm gonna do uh in future uh, uh because i researched a, the wildfire in california which happens uh, this year, uh -huh. but how, however, our neon AOP didn't cover that data yet. So, right. Yeah. So I would yeah. like to do that after they collected the data. Absolutely, it'll be fascinating to see what happened at SOAP and SJER and and all those sites um, following those fires this year. Yeah. Any other questions for Hal before we move on? Okay, then we will move on to Blaise Lasala. He's gonna be talking about automated detection of sinkholes and karst features from high resolution aerial LIDAR. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right, thanks so much. I'm gonna go ahead and hit start. All right. So thanks, Dr. Duffy, for the introduction. I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time coming out here and listening to us today. My name is Blaise Lasala. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Techie Sankey's Geoinformatics Lab here at Northern Arizona University. Today, I'll be talking about something very near and dear to my heart, sinkholes and rainforests. And the focus area, just to get an idea of what you're looking at, is a coniferous rainforest called Tongass National Forest, which is the largest national forest in the country at over 15 million acres. And the Tongass is in Southeast, in Ala uh, Southeast Alaska. Uh, so they get about 12 feet of rain a year. It's pretty wet. Uh, the Tongass is one of the few remaining forests where old growth harvesting still occurs in the US. And this is a recent clear cut on Prince of Wales Island, which is, if you're trying to get an idea how big this place is, this is roughly the size of Delaware. Um, so a good portion of the forest on Prince of Wales Island is located on karst, especially on Prince of Wales. So that's a big deal because where you cut trees, where karst is, it all goes underground and it starts to uh, mess around with a lot of things. <laughs> so the trees hold back the soil. Once the trees are gone, the soil sinks into the subsurface. That affects water quality. Salmon use the caves and springs actually to spawn in. And it also affects the endemic species out there. So this is an unsurveyed karst sinkhole field located in the central part of Kosciuszko Island in Alaska. And it basically is a meter scale resolution LIDAR from the DGGS which is basically the, uh, whatever you want to call the, the survey for the state of Alaska. So what I want, want to do is basically take the geometry from that LiDAR point cloud and turn it into a classifier using a free plugin on cloud compare known as Canupo. And so this is the workflow. If you're wondering what it looks like, you basically take the uh, LiDAR data, you do some iteration on classification and then it spits out something that is a sinkhole or not a sinkhole. So pretty basic classifier, but it uses geometry instead of raster-based stuff. If you're wondering what that looks like, uh, this is a graphical representation of that. You make what you think of the sinkhole is uh, supposed to look like. You do a test training data set, and you sort of iteratively work through that test training data set to tease out what's a sinkhole and what's not. 
On the top right, uh, red is what's classified as a sinkhole after several iterations, and blue is what's classified as terrain. So this is a pretty good classifier so far uh, using the test that I've been working on, but it can be better. So why is this useful? It's a point cloud-based classifier, which is more novel than a raster base. It enables people to find areas where there's a likely, higher likelihood of sinkholes and protect them from logging. And it also protects water system trees and salmon, which rely on caves and spring for spawning. You also won't be able to go out and do a lot of boots on the ground stuff out here because it's so remote and the US Forest Service doesn't have a lot of budget for that stuff. So this makes a job of targeting where sinkholes are a lot easier for people who are searching for these things and trying to identify what's important. Uh, so this is the data. It's the State of Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys. They do an amazing job with the LiDAR stuff. You can pull it off using R or using their online website. And special thanks to Nicholas Brodu for the Canupo Classifier plugin on Cloud Compare. And of course, Cloud Compare is an open source and free tool, so everybody can use it. So uh, it's uh, going to be easy to reproduce and use in other areas because, again, it's geometry based. Um, so. That's about it. I would like to open it up to questions, but I would also like to thank Dr. Teki Sankey for the tutorial on how to use Canupo and also Joshua Castor. He's a lab mate of mine who was uh, able to explain to me how Canupo actually does geometry based classification, which was uh, pretty useful, I would say. And that's all I got. Fantastic. Thanks, Blaise. Um... Could you talk a little bit more about your interest in sinkholes and karst topography and how it how it um, fits into your dissertation work? Sure, thanks. I appreciate getting the opportunity. So most of my dissertation work is focused on caves and remote sensing, which is kind of a misnomer because obviously caves are GPS denied environments. You don't have satellites, but uh, I work with uh, terrestrial LIDAR and other sorts of sensing equipment in there. So I think by tying in sinkholes, which are intrinsically connected to caves based off of karst, you're going to definitely have a more integrative idea of what the surface is and how it reacts to the subsurface. So they're both integrated. A lot of people think that they're completely isolated, but if you're able to tie these things in, you have a better idea of where the contaminants are coming from, where the impacts coming from, and where potential hazards might be in the future. Fantastic. And I know that you considered a bunch of other neon data over the course of over the course of this course <laughs> um, to think about caves, including some of the hydrologic data. I wonder if you could talk about some of that because you had so many interesting ideas. Oh, yeah, I, there, there's absolutely so many things you can do with hydrological data and using remote sensing has, I think, uh, really re revolutionized a lot of that stuff, I think. You can uh, figure out with cave scans, which you have to go in and scan the cave, which is a real pain. But if you combine cave scans with stuff on the surface, say the sinkholes, you can see that geologic relationship very clearly in a lot of places, especially if it's a fault dominated or a joint controlled system. So uh, this, I think, has a lot of implications for how that sort of geology is going to be used to make management decisions and to understand the you know stuff that we can't see, that black box that is the hydrological system under our feet. So it's really exciting, and I cannot wait to see where I can take it. Great. Yeah, me either. Fantastic work. Um, do we have any questions for Blaise before we move on to our last presentation? Also, thanks for being so flexible, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you all just sort of shooting from the hip today as there's power outages all over town. So. Um, I'm, so, I'm just impressed by your, how pulled together you guys are. Um, so finally, um, as our last Ignite talk, we have Scooter Novak, who's going to be talking about utility consumer data aggregation standards, or UCDAS version 1.0. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good, because I've got multiple monitors here, and it's really weird trying to share stuff on some of these. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit start here. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, and I appreciate everybody hanging out for the last one here. I will not lay claim that the best was saved for last, but uh, I have enjoyed what I've been working on. Uh, the Utility Consumer Data Aggregation Standard is an effort to standardize the aggregation, the de-identification, and the analysis of um, utility consumer data. I'm the author of version one. Dr. Benjamin Ruddle is the editor and I believe the owner of the original concept and the data owner is Aaron Young. Consumer data is private, and it's not just the personal information that's in it, it's the amount of the utility that you use as well that uh, makes it private. 
This uh, prevents the data from being released to the public uh, in its raw form. That raw data has to be aggregated such that it cannot be reverse engineered to identify a specific individual or specific individuals or um, um, organizations. These derived products that have been aggregated can be released to researchers for additional analysis, uh, even released to the public as final products. My current implementation right now is about 3,000 lines of a combination of Python and R code. The raw data product that I'm using for this is Flagstaff's potable water for 2017, although there are decades of this data available. The data goes through five different levels of processing. The first four levels, zero through three, uh, are not releasable to the general public. I want to point out that the significance to this class is that the migration from level one to level two also integrates uh, two Google APIs and several KML files that are uh, that accompany the raw data. Level four is essentially the derived products that can be released to the pub public. Right now, my code's producing about 156 derived products in three general formats, data tables, KML files, and standard analyses. This is a high level diagram of my processing pipeline. The raw data enters the process in the top left. It basically goes through in the blue or purple, uh, different chunks of code in order to produce the next level of uh, process data. So the raw data creates level one, or excuse me, level zero. Level zero runs through some code to generate level one. Level one goes to, through some code to generate level two, so on and so forth. What you end up with at level three is a completely clean, documented uh, 8 million lines plus of daily water meter reads. This data file, again, not releasable to the public, can go into the aggregation engine that can produce those 160 or so uh, data products, derived data products. Now, this really busy diagram shows the migration of the data between the different levels. Red indicates data that's in the raw form that is removed because it's not particularly useful. Yellow is data that is maintained. Green is data that is added. And in this particular case, that green information in level one, two, and three is coming from Google uh, APIs and coming from the KML files. On the right side shows uh, tables, how they might look going through the quality control process. The top table does have some blanks in it, you will notice. The second table down shows those blanks removed. Uh, this is a, um, a very general case of the quality control. It's much more complex than that. The bottom table showed what might look, a derived product might look like. The derived products are generally in three formats. The vast majority of them are data tables, data frames. Because the raw data has, can't be released as it is, we want to make this data available to people in usable formats. So this is one of the shorter data frames or data tables that is generated uh, from uh, the code. There are, again, about 130 different uh, tables that are um, being generated. The second derived product are KML files. There are several KML files that are generated by the code. These KML files take the uh, aggregated data from some of those data tables that were previously done, and it builds KML files that can be used in QGIS or ArcGIS. The KML files contain anywhere from a dozen to maybe 16 bits of information, and the person running the, the GIS program can display those as how they want. Uh, using different colors, whatever the case is. Again, the, the KML files are pretty loaded with information, so uh, there's lots of options in terms of how to display this data. The third derived product is a general analysis. Now, this particular section of derived products is growing rapidly right now, uh, and I expect significant amounts of additional code and additional analyses to be done. Uh, the analyses are, that can be done are almost as elaborate as the number of tables that can be generated. Uh, so some of the examples here are histograms, uh, some bar charts. There are also some line uh, graphs and some scatter plots and stuff like that. I thought these were some of the more interesting looking ones for a project that we're currently working on. So in summary, we're taking this private data that is not releasable to anybody outside of the utility, i.e. the water utility, the gas utility, or the electric utility, and we are aggregating it 
and applying some security protocols that I did not get into due to their complexity. And we're generating any number of derived data products, ideally mostly data frames and data tables, but a lot of other stuff. These are such that in a format that they cannot be reverse engineered to again, identify an individual or an organization. By doing that, we can release that information to our little science guy down here, our researcher and finished products to the general public so that they can be analyzed or viewed, answered questions. Uh, the big plus to that is, is this is data that has not been analyzed in the past and has not been made available to researchers or public, uh, the public individuals. So uh, decades worth of information has no doubt got some information in there that would be useful. This uh, final slide shows my references. These are not necessarily all used for this particular slideshow, but these are, this is the start of the references for the actual paper that describes the standard in great detail. Uh, with that, I am seconds from being done and open for questions. Awesome, Scooter, thank you. So my first question is you call this um, V0, or sorry, V1.0. I'm, I'm, it's like a Freudian slip of my textbook, which is V0. <laughs> um, but uh, so if this is V1, where would you hope to take this um, in the future? Like what additional work do you think could be done? That's a great question. Um, and I have thought about that at great lengths over the last six months um, because I think some of the creativity that can be built into this, uh, you know, the, the combination of taking a, a, a data set and combining GIS information with it, extracting information out of the KML files, I think that is, you know, pretty straightforward, although it is a lot of code to do some of that. But I think the creativity here is going to be in the types of GIS information that can be piped into this product. Um, right now we're using just standard things like neighborhood, zip code, zoning. Um, and I think the, the real value here is going to be how creative we can get in uh, those polygons. You know, some of the, some of that, uh, that we've talked about with uh, Aaron at the water, it, uh, water utility is, um, vegetation type, geology type, um, things even I think there is some opportunity to analyze landscape data or landscape water consumption and that's basically your sprinklers, stuff like that. Uh, I think there's some opportunity to see some of that usage and how that uh, plays out based on some of these more unique GIS uh, polygon creations. In addition to that, um, right now this thing processes uh, almost uniquely water data, and it processes it in a, from a CBS file. Uh, the future versions of this, version two, uh, would certainly be more flexible in that it would be able to process directly out of the databases that these organizations have. Again, part of the big problem with this is ownership. It was not an easy task to get me access to this data because, um, I had to become an employee of Flagstaff Water in order to be legally be, have access to the data. So um, that's a little bit of a hurdle. That kind of means I'm the, pretty much the only one working on it. Um, but I want to make the future versions more flexible so that they can specifically query the database. On the other end, I would very much like to make this an R, an R package. Uh, and I can see quite a bit more functionality being built into this and being it, being um, built into an R package that could be flexible enough to process electrical utility data, um, certainly water and um, natural gas data. I mean, ideally it's all consumption data. So it uh, making that flexibility shouldn't be that difficult. Absolutely, and I can see how building in that flexibility and or making an R package out of it could really help people with things like water resource planning, um, projections for future consumption or future needs as Flagstaff is growing very rapidly, um, both as a function of NAU and as a community in general. So. Yeah, and I think it's important to realize that, that um, two things. Uh, one, this data has never been analyzed because most of these utility organizations don't have the background or the experience to analyze this data. This data is almost exclusively used for billing. And there are decades and decades of this information available. So 
patterns, there's just got to be a phenomenal number of patterns that can be picked out of this data uh, that could help with delivery of the utility, that can help with um, leaks, that can help with what we call whales, people that are using more than their share, um, that type of thing. Uh, the other thing that does make this very difficult is I'm dealing with a single data set now, although I have multiple years, it's a single data set. And uh, because of security concerns, I can't go to somebody in California necessarily and say, hey, can I have a copy of your, of your water data? Uh, mm -hmm. Because really I can't have it. That's a little bit of a, of a hurdle. I think we're probably gonna get over that hurdle uh, before too long. Uh, maybe I become employed by a bunch of other places. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's how that works out. So. Yeah, and I can imagine writing into that package some sort of fuzzing kind of like um, what exists with um, Forest Service um, FIA data um, in order to preserve privacy um, would be like a really key step in that sort of package permission type stuff. Um, and GitHub Universe has a really cool- I skipped, Sorry, what? I skipped over the, I skipped over the whole, a whole section that could be its own slideshow on the security that we apply to this. I completely skipped over it because I couldn't talk about it in 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, but there's a rule of that needs to be applied, which helps us extract data that could potentially be reverse engineered to identify people. That right there is its own slideshow on how that's done. It's, it's rather complex and it varies based on the aggregation. So it's not necessarily one function that you can write that applies to everything. It all depends on how you aggregate, aggregate the data on how that rule of 15 is applied. So it's a lot of work. Absolutely. Um, security is one of those like in the in the background things that actually takes up a lot of time and energy and thought and is quite challenging and dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Blaze has a comment that um, perhaps what you're doing could help with cholera. And then um, I don't know mm -hmm. if you had a comment on that or Blaze, if you wanted to expand that comment. Um, but another thing that popped into my mind is um, a linkage between Cameron's presentation and yours, which is that the National Forest Foundation has been lobbying water utilities down in the valley um, to link water use with forest restoration credits, um, essentially because those forests are the main generators of this water, um, as in they're allowing for infiltration and, and things like that. Um, I think it would be really a fantastic um, link to use the output of what you are creating to sort of say we, we pay for the, you know, we pay for the forests that are generating our water or something like that. Um, so that'd be something to sort of think about in the future as far as like a novel proposal. That comes into the, the uniqueness or the um, creativity we can get into with the GIS and other data um, and how we can integrate that in because the water data itself, although private and, it, large in or extremely um, large in terms of a time frame doesn't contain a whole lot of information based on characteristics. Customer class is a, one of very few things that is alone in the data set, the raw data set that can actually help break that information out. The real uniqueness comes with how, now that we know where all these meters are located through Google and stuff like that, how do we break down that geographic area, how do we identify the different characteristics of that geographic area and tie these meters into that? And what does it tell us? So, yep. Fantastic. Well, that concludes the presentation section. Um, 